So Brexit's actually quite a hard topic to talk about. It's, it's an absolutely huge topic, but nobody really knows what it means. Our new Prime Minister, Theresa May, has coined the phrase, Brexit means Brexit, but uh, I don't think she's paused to explain to the rest of us what exactly she means by that. But it's a topic I think has been pervading, certainly in the background, the whole of this meeting, but I think regrettably it didn't get the attention it deserved on the session on Monday morning with Commissioner Moedas and our new minister, our reappointed minister for universities and science, Joe Johnson, and I thought it was extremely regrettable that after a debate in which one of the major issues was democratic accountability, uh, that uh, those two figures did not opt to give the audience questions. So I hope that we'll have a chance for questions um, this morning. And so I'm going very deliberately to keep my remarks uh, very brief, and they will probably just simply raise um, a number of questions. There's, there's sort of three points I want to make. One is to do with uh, the political question, which is, you know, should we fight or should we acquiesce? I mean, uh, um, um, I mean, the vote is the vote, and the Prime Minister has taken office and said that, you know, Brexit means Brexit, and they will eventually, that, you know, the procedure is very clear. The UK has to activate Article 50, and two years after that, then the UK is no longer um, um, a member of the EU. Now, she has appointed uh, three ministers to sort of take charge of that process, uh, Boris Johnson, Liam Fox, and David Davis, uh, but they have an extraordinarily complex task ahead of us, uh, ahead of them, sorry, thank God. Um, <laughs> but it, it, there is a question, I think, as to whether or not she's, because she's appointed prominent leavers in the campaign, whether or not that's a political calculation and she's sort of setting them up to fail, perhaps, and so that if they don't come back with a, a settlement that actually means Brexit, that it'll be easier politically for her to sell that to her party and then to the country. And so maybe in that space, and if there's a shift in the EU uh, in that time, then in two or three years' time down the line, you know, who knows what sort of deal we'll be able to negotiate that might actually mean that we're not actually as far apart from the EU as, we, as the votes seem to indicate. But that could simply be wishful thinking on my part, and there's lots of scope for wishful thinking. At the end of the day, the vote was very clear. The, the, the margin may have been slender, but it was a vote um, to leave, and that's the democratic will of the people. Um, but I wonder, even given that, is there perhaps then a settlement that means that the scientific community can, in effect, stay within the EU and have access to all these sort of rich and um, productive research collaborations that we've been enjoying up to now? Uh, certainly the scientific community has very strong support for um, remaining within the EU. I think even politically, despite the vote, one could make the case that might be acceptable to uh, the vast majority of the population that you know it's a very very good thing for British science to remain uh, in the European Union. No one ever woke up one day and said you know what would be a great thing for British science is to get out of the EU and to you know charge ahead into a bright new future. So maybe there's an argument there that uh, and, and certainly I would like as a campaigner that uh, the the community gets together to, to to push for the best settlement that we can get. A couple of final points just on lessons for academics. Uh, we are, in a sense, hampered by our respect for evidence and facts and things like truth. And in pieces that I wrote in the run-up to the um, uh, referendum vote, I was trying in the best scholarly traditions to be even-handed, to sort of look at the arguments on one side and then to go in and sort of look at, at the arguments on the other side. And I think it's fair to say that we got roundly trashed by a very well-organized campaign that played on emotion, had for some very strong messages, but was, in the memorable phrase of the Liverpool professor for European law, uh, run, on, uh, run using dishonesty on an industrial scale. And so, you know, is our response to that to say, well, you know, let's maybe go for the rhetoric and forget about all the uh, evidence sifting? And I certainly think we don't want to step back in that uh, direction. We've got to um, sell our love of evidence and analysis and rationality, uh, but we've got to do a much better job of making that case to a much broader constituency than we managed to do um, beforehand. Stephen, and I, think, I think you're three minutes oh, up. Oh, okay, they're well up. Okay. <laughs> Save the rest for later. You'll right, have another It'll chance. come up. I beg your pardon. Um, Anne, would you mind um, continuing for another three minutes and then we'll open it up? I will do. Um, first of all, can I have a show of hands? How many German speakers are here? Okay, I'm about to insult you. Ich bin einer Europäer. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to say that. 
Um, and I suppose it's, it's brought home to us, um, uh, particularly not just me as a scientist working all my life in science, but it's brought home to me how important the European Union is to me. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. Stephen was talking about the campaign. Because it's always been there uh, during most of my adult life, and because we never talk about its success, it was rather easy to dismiss it. And one thing that I wanted to mention is that when I worked in Brussels for three years, I went there in 2012. And in 2012, all of us in this room and the European institutions, we won the Nobel Peace Prize because we have had peace in Europe and that has been delivered by the European project. And my greatest fear is not actually for science, it's that we give up that project and no one benefits from that. So that is my deep concern. Following on from what Stephen said about how the campaign was fought, we scientists need to wake up because we didn't send out the right messages and I would not for one minute advocate that we fight a dirty campaign. It is uh, in nobody's interest to do that. And I think that the way the campaign was fought was shameful, uh, and we all share some of that shame. But we do need to understand that by just talking about facts, it, it, it simply doesn't move people. Uh, and we need to remember that the basic thing for anything, for new technology, for changing people's minds, we have to remember that there's a very simple common denominator that matters to Europeans, to any global citizen, and that is, <coughs> what's in it for me? And we didn't answer that question. What's in it for the citizen to remain a part of the EU? Stephen's already said, so I'll go over it quickly. Um, we've got no leadership. Uh, I was delighted to see Commissioner Moedash at this conference, walking around, interacting with people freely, sparking up conversations, uh, being engaged, taking part in many, many activities, discussing and talking. Um, and I was just, I, I suppose, astounded. I did not understand why our minister, Joe Johnson, seemed so disengaged. And I, I have to say that he was invited to this session uh, but did not wish to come. And it wasn't a matter of coming and sitting here and answering questions. I, I do see why that might have caused him difficulty, but he could have listened. He could have listened and would have gained a lot by doing that. So I will finish on saying, what do we do now? Well, if there's one thing we're good at, is that we are very imaginative. And I think one of the most creative things you could do with your life is science. So we're imaginative, we're creative, we're smart. So we should come up with solutions. And I think for all of us, whether you're in any of the categories that, that Gail highlighted, uh, and whether you voted to remain or to leave, it's in all our interests to think imaginatively about what the future might look like. And one thing that we could consider, because for most of us, membership, full membership of Horizon 2020 and all the funding instruments around that, they're really important, not just for the UK, but for European science. So one thing we could start to explore, and it might sound contradictory, but I don't think it is, is that could we get full membership of Horizon 2020 by the UK and agree to free movement of scientists. So categorizing the different sectors in the European market and trade will be different and there will be, uh, it is unlikely that the UK government would wish to negotiate free movement of people or labor in a general context. But if we narrow it down, and this actually is different from the Swiss situation. Could we have Horizon 2020 with free movement of scientists to still, st as a starting point, to try and capture 
the great advantage of this funding instrument that allows us to collaborate not just within the EU, but allows us to collaborate with the best scientists in the world. Thank you, Gil. Thank you, Anna. I, um, I like the idea of maybe developing a, a scientist passport, <coughs> that you could, sort of scientist card that you could show as you go through passport <laughs> control. Um, uh, Jürgen, uh, Lauritz, either of you want to spend a, a moment just to respond to those comments? I don't mind follow on to Anne because I agree to everything she said. I think the most important part of oh, outcome is if we give up the project of peace in Europe. I think nobody wanted that, but I remind you that there's another vote going on on the 8th of November and one of the candidates wants to give up at least some part of NATO. So we are living in kind of interesting times that was not foreseen a few months ago. I guess that many, when they woke up uh, on the 24th of June, uh, would like to think that they had a bad dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, bad dreams, they have uh, a tendency to go away. Uh, and I think we can certainly say that Midsummer Night didn't have a strike of light, uh, but it's not going to go away. Brexit is a reality, as you say. The Prime Minister uh, said Brexit is Brexit, and you say well, nobody knows what Brexit is, so maybe after all it is a bad dream. Uh, but we would, uh, it remains to be seen. It is a reality, and I, I know you are living in an island, so many of you have at least seen the sea, and many of you have been in a boat. And everybody, every sailor knows that when a gale is coming, there's only one way to survive, that's to face it, to put the bow against the wind and face the gale. Otherwise, you will not survive. So you have to face the reality. Brexit is the reality, and to try to find ways around uh, the, the problem for Britain and we on the European uh, continental side will have to help to find uh, ways to solve this problem. Uh, Lawrence, can I, can I just stop you there in terms of you moving into um, what the rest of Europe might do? Because I'd like to save that topic of discussion okay. just a little bit That's later. fine. Um, Jürgen, if I might mind to you, if you can just maybe just talk about the academic perspective first. Yeah, and, and then I'll I, I just to wanted to, to pick up on one point which both Stephen and Anne mentioned, which was, you know, the, the, the disappointment that seems to be around, around you know, Joe Johnson not making um, as much commitment uh, as, uh, as we had hoped. So as well as my day job, uh, I've been advising the uh, UK Government Department of Business, Innovation and Skills, which is now a new department for a couple of years. Um, and uh, I have had one opportunity to speak with uh, the new minister of that department, Greg Clark. Um, and, uh, and, and I can tell you, and I don't want to make any excuses here for Joe Johnson, but I can tell you that they care deeply about science and innovation for the UK. I suspect what happened, and I wasn't in the room, was that, uh, you know, government is in a little bit of shock. The UK is in a little bit of shock. And quite frankly, we don't yet have a worked out position um, on the policy matters going forward. Um, but um, I can assure you um, that uh, as we go forward, um, Britain will be making very strong noises. It was a shame that we missed this opportunity at this great science conference, but there will be very strong noises to make sure that we stay very supportive um, of science and innovation and collaboration with Europe. I just wanted to make that point um, right at the beginning and, uh, and I will of course also be taking those messages back into some of my discussions with government. Fantastic, so that's a really nice message to send out to all of you. So we now know that there is a route back uh, to, to the minister. So it's a perfect opportunity now I think now to invite you to um, uh, give us your thoughts. Um, there are some roving mics so if you wouldn't mind just um, putting your hand up and then just waiting for the mic to come to you. <coughs> so <coughs> anyone would like to? So, wow, that was a very shooting up hands there. Could you just wait for the microphone, please? It's just coming. Dominique Leblu, I'm the editor-in-chief of Science et Avenir in Paris. Uh, 
you, what you just said, which strikes me, there are a lot of uh, British scientists around. How is it that you didn't make an appeal in the very first place, the very first day when the ministers were there? Uh, you, you just have to gather somewhere and say, we are going to push for that. And there was the president of the Royal Society I interviewed, and you could have done something with him. How is it that you don't get organized? That's my first question. Second mm -hmm. question, um, you say, uh, Anne said, um, we have, or, 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 or was it uh, Stephen? I don't, I don't know. Sell our love for, of rationality. Uh, that, that's one thing which strikes me. I read a very long uh, piece about uh, your farmers here, or let's say people who deal with agriculture in your country. How is it that you don't have um, somebody saying, explaining how much you got from EU and how the farmers might be deeply affected by the Brexit. How is it? Th that's rational. You know, that's money, that's activity, that's security of food. You know all very well about these sort of things. How is it that you don't come and, and, and shout? Yeah, I mean, uh, when, and, and, and that, uh, I'll finish with that. Okay. Recently, okay. recently in Paris, there was, uh, 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 well, the minister wanted to cut the financial uh, uh, budget. Well, all the Nobel Prizes just came and said it's impossible. And Villani, who was there, you know, the mathematician, Meadowfields, they all got together and said, we cannot accept. And the money was restored. So why don't you get organized? <laughs> Thank you very much. A very strident statement there. There was an organization called Sci Scientists for the EU, I think, that was, that was trying to do it exactly as you suggest. But I'll leave it to my colleagues to, to respond to that statement. Stephen, perhaps you first? Uh, well, it was probably a bit difficult to get organized in the immediate aftermath of uh, uh, the statement that there would be no questions at the end of the session. Uh, and I think the speakers had left the room before people realized exactly what had happened. But, uh, you know, academics in this country actually are relatively well organized from a campaigning point of view. As Gail mentioned, there was, uh, I thought, a very well put together campaign that's still going on, collecting evidence of the uh, effects um, after the vote, scientists for EU. But also there's the campaign for science and engineering, which has been going for over 30 years, which I'm on the board of. And I'm also part of um, Science is Vital, which was an effective campaign to protect the science budget. And that's uh, a project that is uh, always ongoing uh, in the UK, but probably also in, in many other countries. In terms of rationality, okay. arguing that one can say that, but in the campaign, there was always pushback. Oh, uh, and you know, even the Institute for Financial Studies, which is, you know, prides itself on as independent, was accused of being funded by the EU and therefore you know, anything that they said was immediately subject to question. And that was a, quite a successful political tactic. It was pure rhetoric, uh, and no basis in fact. But, uh, you know, the, the campaign was dirty, and it's, I, I think it did, I guess, take us by surprise because, and I totally agree with Anne, you know, we don't want to get down to that level. But, so, but we have to find a way to communicate effectively to all constituencies. So, you know, there were certain Gail. failings. Now, I know, I know uh, Nancy in the audience is dying to, to say something, so I'll just hand the microphone to Can I just respond? I, I can't speak on behalf of British farmers. Um, and indeed, um, I, you'd have to go to the National Farmers Union. But speaking on behalf of British scientists, um, two comments. Firstly, very, very quickly after the result, there was, and is ongoing, intense activity. There were emergency meetings called of the Council for Science and Technology, the Royal Society Council, I'm a member of both. There's been discussions with senior politicians. Of course, we didn't even know who our ministers were until a good 10 days afterwards, but, but I've had quite a number of conversations with several of them. But I think we have to stand back and take stock. The science approach to Brexit was viewed by many as self-serving. We argued for our money uh, and we argued for universities. And I think to an awful lot of people in the UK, they thought there are things more important than that. Now, that means it is our job now to communicate more effectively, and I think it can't just be academic scientists, it has to be with the whole science community, about the value that science brings to the UK and brings to the European Union. Thank you, Nancy. Um, yeah, actually, I, I do listen to the comments that scientists weren't particularly well organized. And, um, do you know, uh, part of it is that, unfortunately, and I sort of mean that we're not French, I, I sometimes admire 
the direct action and the very passionate way that in France, groups who are feeling under threat really respond quickly. It, it's part of, I suppose, uh, the, the natural behavior. And we've somehow lost that. We're, we're rather too well behaved. And I remember very well when I was in Brussels and there was an issue around funding ag agriculture and the agricultural subsidies. And none of us could move in Brussels for tractors um, and the huge tankers of milk. This kind of annoyed me, uh, kind of spraying milk all over the place. But my goodness, everybody knew about it. And people stopped to think, oh, so what's going on? And that's partly reflecting back to my initial remarks is we need to think more carefully about how we can make um, a legitimate emotional statement. And if I, if I just come to Nancy's point, because it is so pertinent, uh, I don't know how many rather nasty and personal attacks I got leading up to Brexit, because I'm on the advisory board of scientists for the EU, and I did campaign visibly for a Remain. And what people said, and I'm paraphrasing this, I'm saying it nicely, is that uh, I, I am a pig with my nose in the trough. No wonder I want to stay in the EU. And I realized, and it was a shock, that people, citizens, don't understand that for every pound or euro I get from the EU, and I translate into knowledge, that it affects them every minute of every day, every citizen. It's their health care, it's their transport, it's the clean air, it's the safe food that they have, it's the gadgets they use, it's navigation without fear. All of these things come from the translation of that small amount of funding into the jobs, the sustainability, the environmental protection. Everything comes from that. And, and someone, when I said this, said, oh, what about financial sector? We've, that's very strong in the UK. Uh, that's nothing to do with science. <laughs> Not a bit of it. Every transaction that happens in the global financial mac uh, market, that comes from science, engineering, and technology. And somehow all of this is just lost. You know, so we need to do the translation. And, and actually, one last thing, Gail, that I would say, Stephen said uh, at the beginning, and it's worth remembering, Theresa May said uh, Brexit means Brexit and uh, we're still no further forward. We don't know what that means. Uh, I, I live in Scotland, which is a devolved part of the UK, and our fir first, we, we voted uh, very strongly to remain in Scotland. And our first minister said, remain means remain. And we do know what that means. And I think what we're scientists in terms of us organizing, uh, I was genuinely delighted that there was an emergency cabinet meeting the day after the referendum in Scotland. And on the Saturday, our first minister stood up and said, I will gather a group of experts. It will be called the Standing Council for Europe. And we will get the best possible advice to explore all possible options to ensure remain <coughs> means remain, and not in a selfish way. This is not just for Scotland. This is all possible options for the whole of the UK, but how we can organize this somehow by using this union that we have here in the United Kingdom of nations. And I am very pleased to say I am on that standing council. I was invited because the voice of science, engineering, and technology is vital and that is understood at Scottish government level. So there is, there's sort of some hope. And can I ask you on, on that council, um, are there any social scientists who are helping frame the context of the debate in terms of understanding more where the public is coming from? Yeah, there's, there's social science, uh, there's diplomacy, <laughs> there's people with a background in diplomacy. In fact, Lord Kerr, John Kerr, is on that council. And John Kerr, interestingly enough, was the architect of Article 50. So he wrote that. Um, <laughs> so he, kno he knows the loopholes. <laughs> but, but he also said at the time, 
uh, that when he wrote it, that there were a lot of people fighting not to have it because they said, this is ludicrous. We will never need such an article. And he was one of those people. He ended up getting the job of writing it. But uh, I take your point exactly. We need to learn from the mistakes and make sure that we don't just come out with a Same series of, oh, yeah, here are the facts, you know, you're going to find this compelling. Won't work. Um, so now I'd like to hand over to, to Jürgen to say um, a little bit more about the UK industry perspective and then we can have a further discussion. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, just to start by saying, uh, ich bin auch ein sehr stolzer Europäer. It's <laughs> much better. Um, as, you, uh, as you said, and, and uh, like <coughs> you and, <coughs> and uh, like uh, many of us here in the room, uh, I know Nancy, um, and many others, I was also a very strong campaigner um, for remaining in the EU. I agree with Nancy's point that, uh, you know, part of the reason why our message didn't get through is maybe because our communication wasn't um, clear enough, wasn't emotional enough and didn't address the needs of the general public enough. However, you know, having tried very hard myself at putting arguments across which were, you know, very rational, I thought, very logical and very accurate, because that's what we as business people and as scientists do. The real problem that we had is that our rational statements were just not as interesting as the comedy act that was going on between Boris Johnson, Farage, David Cameron and others. And unfortunately, the British media didn't fulfill their responsibility and were never going to, right from the outset. So a true debate was never really heard by the public. But all of that is history. And uh, I also feel in the discussion that we've just been having, you know, we actually need to start turning the discussion because to now talk about spilt milk as we say here in the UK, is not going to move us forward. So I think we do now have to find a way forward outside of the EU. To now try to start the conversation, maybe it was the wrong decision, and is there not a way to remain, I think is actually the wrong way to go. The language would get even more ugly and unhelpful. So I think we have a role now as scientists and as business people to turn the conversation to positive. And let me tell you, I'm finding that incredibly <laughs> difficult because in the end, what will happen is the people who didn't want the position of where we're in will actually be the people who will do be doing the legwork to get us the best possible deal. So let me just talk about a few of the areas where I think we can be positive and where I think we start need to be talking to take the point of the lady in the middle who spoke more stronger and with a stronger voice to our ministers in terms of what we can positively do in terms of getting the right outcome for science and particularly British science collaboration with the European Union. The first one of those is, is that I think we should push very hard that in the Chancellor's autumn statement, so that is a statement made here by our UK's Chancellor about the future and the likely spending priorities, that in that we see a very, very clear commitment for R&D, science and innovation. And I think there should be a very public statement at that point that the shortfall in science budget that we may see as a result of the Brexit, which is roughly 850 million pounds a year, that that shortfall will be met in whatever way we end up negotiating the deal. And actually in the scheme of things, 850 million pounds is actually not a huge sum of money to create that confidence for our industry. The second point that I would argue for is let's use this opportunity. I sometimes say, don't waste a crisis. And let's use the opportunity to create a stronger industrial strategy and within that to have a plan to improve the level of gross R&D and to do that in partnership between business, science and government and to significantly raise our spend of R&D as a proportion of R&D. It currently stands at 1.7% and I think should stand closer to 3%. My third point is 
make a clear commitment that any immigration system, you've already talked about it, Anne, makes it very clear that scientists, and I include professional engineers in this, have a right and are absolutely welcome to stay here for as long as they want. And my final point is to send a very strong signal to the EU that it is absolutely our intention through our negotiations to find a way to stay part of those programmes like Horizon 2020 so that we quickly stop any of this nonsense about British scientists being excluded from such discussions at this stage because there is no intention that we will ever leave those activities. And I think those are some of the positive things that we as a science community and as a business community can start doing. If I may just make one final point, and that is I also think we ought to send one very strong message to the Brexiteers, and that is let us, the science and business community, work with government to get on with it and sort these things. One thing we ask from you is to run a campaign to stop this dreadful xenophobia and horrible language that we are seeing here that are beginning to make some of our scientists and engineers to question whether they want to live in this country. And that is extremely unhelpful. And we must ask the Brexiteers, they created the fear around this sort of language, and they now ought to be standing up and say, is enough is enough, let's unite, and let's make Britain what it is, which is an open country, which is tolerant, and values everybody in our society that contributes to engineering science or indeed for any other work that they may do in this country. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I'd like to open up the floor again, actually, to offer some more questions because we've been talking for quite some time. Um, I saw Luke's hand um, up there. Uh, so perhaps a microphone can come to you first and then the gentleman over there in the white T-shirt and then the lady. Sorry, no, I'm sorry, that it was in the, in the middle. Well, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add one different point. I, I fully agree with what Jürgen says, that we must be pragmatic, go for the best deal and everything else. But I don't agree with the statement that Brexit is Brexit. We live in a representative parliamentary democracy where you're entitled to change your mind from one election to another. And if somebody puts a leaflet through my door at the next general election saying that they wish to overturn this result, that to me is a higher vote than the one that we had in the referendum. Parliament created the referendum. Parliament also has the power to negate it if we have passed through uh, another election. And uh, I do believe as a citizen that uh, that is what we should do uh, as a professional. I also agree that we should continue to work for the best deal we can in the circumstances. Thank you very much. So the gentleman over there in the white t-shirt, please. Uh, hello, a little bit of background. So I did my PhD in the UK. I'm a Polish citizen. I currently live in China, so I'm not directly affected. Uh, I am affected by the, by the way how the, how, how the build-up to the referendum was was done as a Polish citizen. I mean, that was probably the least popular group around. And I really liked the discussion. It was really nice. It started with the EU Nobel, uh, with the Nobel Prize for the EU for, for keeping the peace in Europe and so on and so forth. And then it went to more pragmatic things, as it usually does, that is money and whether Horizon 2020 money can be used by UK scientists. And I totally understand why is it important for UK scientists to become, to remain a part of the Horizon 2020, but I also don't think there is a problem. I mean, Theresa May said that she's not going to invoke Article 50 till 2017. Horizon 2020 runs to, 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 to 2020 with the projects finishing long afterwards. So I don't think this money is in any danger. Uh, but as we say in Poland, there is no point of crying over spilled milk. As as, as has been already said, and I do totally think that it is important to get the best possible deal, but at the moment, I think it's about 27 member states to figure out what's the best deal for them, rather than 
trying to figure out what's the best deal for the UK. The UK has already made up the, uh, their mind, I suppose. Okay, thank, so thank, thank you. I'd like uh, to hold... One thing, one, one more if thing. If it's brief, because there's lots, quite a few other people... Okay, lovely. Uh, the next thing is... Uh, mm, the UK has been benefiting from the influx of brain from continental Europe to here. And... Uh, Maybe we should not waste this crisis and try to figure out how we can reintegrate those people back into the continent for the benefit of 27 member states. Okay, thank you. Um, rather than us talk for a little while, I want to take a few more points from the floor. Um, so the gentleman on the end, please. My name is uh, Gordon Dalton. I'm the chair of the International Consortium of Research Staff Associations. Um, I thought, I was wondering if you'd mind asking how many people have directly had the impact of uh, proposal withdrawals from Horizon 2020. Uh, I myself have come across four of them. Uh, th these are just right now people I've heard of that have had proposals failed. Would you mind just showing your hands at anybody Is who's had anyone? a direct impact? Okay, that's so not interesting. Not um, uh, one that. of the members of the International Consortium of Research Staff Associations is the UK Research Staff Association. And I think it's going to give uh, a very important reason uh, and mission for the UK Research Staff Association to maintain that strong link to the international researchers in Europe uh, and, and to maintain this link and to forge that the fact that scientists in Britain are part of European science. Thank you. I'll take uh, one more question. The lady in the middle, please, with a hand up. Just a very brief thought. It's all good about moving on, but what are the learnings that we can all take out of this? I mean, how this vote went, and I think that's actually the bad message. I mean, the result of the vote is bad enough, but how it came about, I think that's the really horrible news. Uh, so I completely agree with Anne. We need to see how can we also, in an emotive way, speak to people and bring our arguments across. But I think we need to look now into how we can assure if a similar vote took place again in 20 years' time, that we have a bigger part of the population, first, who knows that it's important to go and vote, and second, people who are amenable to rational arguments. I mean, what can we do with education in the UK and also in Europe and beyond now, so people are not emotion, emotional ridden, falling for lies, are not able to question themselves, the information <laughs> they receive, and so on. Because this is a real threat to democracy. And it's in all our interests that we have educated people, even those who are leaving school when they're 16 years old, that they're able for themselves to see the arguments and look behind the surface lies and take a proper decision. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> so now I'd like to um, invite Laurits to talk about the non-UK perspective, which was highlighted by the gentleman over there. So the, p the point of view of, of other member states, would you like to say a, word, a few words on that, Laurits? I'm more than happy to say something. Unfortunately, I'm not French, so I don't have the French emotions, and I'm not Polish, and I'm not Scottish, and I'm not English, I'm Danish. But, um, um, I think it came as a shock to all of us because, in fact, the popular vote in, in Britain affects all of our, the rest of Europe's citizens' life. So, in, in a way, it's also kind of a, a, an outcome of democracy that is probably not expected. Um, and it could have happened in any other country. Let's say my own country would have had the same vote. We would also have voted us out at this moment. And uh, because it's a smaller country, maybe less noise and maybe we would have had another uh, election two years from now like uh, Luke Giorgio suggested, like they've had in Ireland seven times. So it, it's possible in smaller countries. <coughs> and, uh, but uh, um, maybe uh, from seen from the outside, uh, it maybe a little bit of humility or humbleness could be in place now. And I also think that it's time to find out what this Brexit means. If you know about navigation, it's very easy to decide we want to get to the moon or something like that. It's less easy to get there. And especially if you don't know where you are. And I would argue when you, your government don't know what Brexit means, that means the country doesn't know where it is. 
and this is very, very hard to navigate. It, you you ha ought to find out where you are, the sooner the better. It, and, and this has nothing to do with Horizon 2020, by the way. This is a long-term thing for Great Britain, for Europe, for, for the world. <coughs> and, and so you have a much larger, wider um, responsibility than figure it out, figuring out that you can still participate in Horizon 2020. By the way, uh, yesterday, um, some of us had a, a, a small meeting with uh, the commissioner and other people from Brussels, and they are a little bit unhappy that everybody like ERC, but we don't say or think it's part of the EU system. We want ERC to become more independent, yes. So all the good things we don't want to, to, to link to the EU, we want them to become independent, national or whatever. And so we forget the good part and we try to remember all the bureaucracy and all the bad part. I'm also this uh, migration issue. Think about students. There's so many students migrating to Great Britain. Dan Danish students, for example, they, they are treated here like British students now. What will happen in the future? And if, if they are not treated like uh, citizens here, why should they go to Britain and not to Canada or Australia? If we are going, to, our students are going to pay the double fee or whatever it is. Uh, it, it, and of course, they would like to be in a country where they can use the British language or English language because it's easier than, we think it's easier than German or French. But, so th but your market is changing, is what I'm saying. Um, and then, as I said in the beginning, I, I don't think it's fair to expect from the other partners in this coming negotiation any free launches. I mean, there will be tough negotiations. This is what is going to come. This is facing the wind. You have to be humble. You have to be willing to pay your part. And you cannot only cherry pick the good parts, the ones you like. This is a package system. There's many things we don't like from the EU. But we take the package or we don't take the package. And then we negotiate, but on the other side of the table, you will find equally prepared people. And then the final note. I, I haven't been in, in, in England during the, or Britain during the last uh, couple of months, so I don't know the language. But I, I remember many debates from the parliament, which for me is quite shocking uh, because I know the British people are much more polite than Danes. We ad admire your <laughs> linguistic skills, we admire your politeness, and we are simply rude people compared to British <laughs> people. <laughs> <coughs> then listening to the debates from the, uh, from the Parliament, where they are standing and screaming at each other, I think it, 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 I have only <laughs> seen things like that in the kindergarten. <laughs> So I, I, I'm not surprised that this <coughs> was extended into the debate, and I don't think it's the kind of a culture so you can't change. Cultures is hard to change. Thank you. <laughs>